Part 1, Chapter 1 One dark cloud on a sunny afternoon. The overthrow of military rule in Bangladesh in 1990 through a popular uprising could well be termed as a mini-revolution, spearheaded by the two major parties, the Aumi League, AL, and the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, BNP. The former led the country through the political movement of for independence and the Liberation War, and the latter was born under the guardianship of the country's first military ruler, General Zia, two unlikely bedfellows coming together to oust a common adversary, the military dictatorship of General Eshad. Bangladesh started its renewed journey towards democracy and reinstituted the parliamentary form of government, replacing the presidential system, presumably sealing the route for extra-constitutional forces to commandeer the state by seizing the office of the president. The BNP formed a government after the election of February 1991 under the amended constitution. The euphoria attendant of people's power was soon whisked away in the face of realities of governing a poor country and exacerbated by the BNP's own legacy. The government, a malign opportunist politicians of varied backgrounds with authoritarian roots, could hardly be expected to champion the cause of an incohate democracy. Thus, while still in power, the BNP started manipulating the offices that were to conduct the next election so blatantly that the opposition army league, with the support from the other minor parties, launched a vigorous movement to stop the national election being hijacked. After a sham election in February 1996 and a government that lasted only a few months, the BNP caved to public demands by amending the constitution, incorporating an innovation in political institution building, a provision of a 90-day non-partisan caretaker government to oversee national election and the transition from one elected government to another. The Aumili won the election subsequently held in June 1996, conducted by the caretaker government, followed by a BNP Jamaat coalition taking office in the subsequent election of October 2001, with each party completing a full five-year term. It looked as if all well for democracy. Political parties all over the world, once in office, are obliged to look after their workers. Most often, this is discreet and surreptitious process. But by 2006, a harmful mutation of governance in Bangladesh was unraveling. Emboldened by the past election victories, the BNP Jamaat government carried forth politicization of public institution to such an extent that none was left untouched. Most importantly and ominously, they designed and started implementing a strategy of capturing institutions that were crucial in the conduct of fair election. The constitution was amended, raising the retirement age of judges to 67, which would ensure that the next chief of caretaker government, the last retired chief justice, would be their man. The chief election commissioner was also chosen. The civil administration, police and the field officials of the election commission were carefully chosen to ensure party loyalty. These mechanisms were enough ground for the opposition to vow to resist such choreographed elections. Thus, during the second half of 2006, political dissensions turned into confrontations that soon morphed into violent forms, pushing the country to a verge of anarchy. In a report that I wrote for the World Bank in April 2007, this is how I summed up the situation. March of 2006 was a lost period. The run to the national election scheduled in January 2007 had further vitiated the already deteriorating conditions of governance in Bangladesh almost to a dysfunctional stage. While the incumbent party was designed to elaborate strategy for rigging the election, euphemistically termed as election engineering, a more venal version of gerrymandering in the US, the opposition parties were hell-bent to stop it from happening through national shutdowns, blockades to the capital, the highways and massive street protests. 
The country was sharply divided, bureaucracy was politicized, and even professional platforms were being used by public officials as springboards for contesting national elections. The capture of institution was so pervasive that they almost lost their intended character and were being manipulated for predatory ambitions. In such ideal conditions, corruptions became the order of the day, starting from the very top. According to the constitutional amendment incorporating the caretaker government, the president who otherwise hold a ceremonial post assumed significant power during the transition period, including the responsibility of inviting persons for the office of chief advisor. In the face of mounting opposition to the claim of the just retired Chief Justice who was once an office bearer of the BNP, Justice Hassan declined to take upon himself the responsibility of Chief Advisor. The President, contrary to the options available to him under the Constitution, assumed the post himself at the behest of BNP from behind the scenes, thereby adding fuel to the fire. A few attempts were made by the president to run his councils of advisors, which imploded one after another. As tension and violence gripped the country, rumors spread of an army takeover. 11 January 2007 An eerie silence kept the nation in a wrap. My wife went ahead with her plan to celebrate my 62nd birthday, not forgetting to have babu cheese from old Dhaka to grill kebab on our rooftop garden. But the adda among the invited guests could not go beyond the politics of Bangladesh, with animated discussion on its future course. As argumentative Bangladeshis, each one had an opinion, as if through looking into the future in a crystal ball. A direct takeover by the army was ruled out given the failure of such experiments globally. Moreover, even if there were ambitious quarter in army, they would be reined in by the fact that Bangladesh army had a large presence in UN peacekeeping operation, which could be in jeopardy if international support was waning. It appeared to be a dead end. Halfway through the dinner, news came of an imposition of emergency and curfew. We were unsure of what had come upon the country, an army takeover or something else. But for sure, our guests had to get back home and the kababwala to their den before the curfew hour set in. Everything was wrapped up in no time and all made their way to their homes. The next few days brought some clarity. A civilian caretaker government was formed with support of an army headed by a retired mid-level World Bank bureaucrat, assisted by a few more retired international civil servants. The agenda of the government appeared to be more than conducting a free and fair election within 90 days, enlarging its domain to include reforms of the dysfunctional governance, its inheritance of losses, an Augean stable with crumbling institutions in terminal conditions. As peace was restored and civil life began to get back to normalcy, the nation breathed sigh of relief. A resurrection based on purgatory right awaited it. The caretaker government, among other reforms, embarked upon the anti-corruption drive with a messianic zeal. This was welcomed by the people at large who had seen the worst of its kind. In the grab of democracy, Bangladesh had traveled back in time to a feudal order. Mass arrests followed criminals sheltered by the governing elites, politicians, businessmen, and public officials were sent behind bars under the emergency laws. This drive soon took a dubious character, overseen through a number of task forces led by mid-level army intelligence officer, aided and abetted by mainstream army, the process soon started mutating into a strain different from its avowed form. Stories going around the capital included the use of torture to extract information, including false testimony in filing cases and then prosecuting individuals, initially politicians and businessmen of all shades of opinion, and finally two ex-prime ministers to end that was billed as dynastic rule. The shadowy nature of the enforcers, their raids on residents, more appropriately, break-ins typically at midnight, taking away people blind folded as terror-stricken family members looked on, lent an eerie twist to the nobler cause that were to have been in pursuit of. 
Months rolled by as we witnessed the unfolding story from the wings. On the 6th August, while I was facilitating a workshop in local government training institute at Agargao, I was interrupted by a phone call from one Major H of the task force who asked me to see him the next day at 10 in the morning at his office set up in the MP hostel. Adjacent to the campus, I had retired from five years earlier. Was it to undermine the Member of Parliament? No one liked receiving such calls from the task force. I quickly scanned my life as a civil servant and found no instance that could be reason for me to be concerned. Yet, I was apprehensive given the notoriety the task forces had attained. On my way home, I stopped at one of my friends, Shafiq's office, to share the information and get his assessment. He too felt that I had no reason to be concerned and assured me by saying that it must be a routine call for assistance. I was working as a consultant for UNDP. The first thought that came to my mind was to use this position to ward off any looming threat. Knowing that the UNDP was maintaining close contact with the caretaker government, I was once asked to comment on an internal memo concerning policy assistance to the government. I called up Manoj Basyant, the newly appointed director of UNDP and a friendly soul from Nepal, and briefed him about my meeting with the task force. Though non-committal, Manoj gave me a patient hearing and asked me to keep him posted. Days later, on Saturday, August 11, 2007, I updated him through email. Dear Manoj, I was summoned by one Major H of Anti-Corruption Task Force 27 in Shere Bangla Nagar on August 7th at 10 a.m. Two and a half hour of discussion followed, mainly on barge-mounted power plants, an innovative solution executed by the government of Sheikh Hasina by bringing in power plants mounted on barges and moving them quickly inland through rivers to solve the acute shortage of power, a legacy of past BNP government implemented in 1997. I went through some of the 10-year-old files. The upshot was that I have to cooperate with the investigation to which I agreed and give evidence against the former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina at their bidding, to which I declined. I made it clear that I shall only speak the truth and shall not be intimidated to falsehood. The major indicated, not in so many words, that if I do not owe their line, I shall be in trouble. I reiterated my earlier position. My passport was taken away. I was told that they will get back to me in a couple of days. The matter-of-fact mail does not convey the ignominy that I had to suffer. Being called by a junior officer of the army, who possibly was still attending school when I was a sitting secretary of the government, to account for my discharge of responsibilities. Having retired from public service over half a decade earlier and lived out of public view, this meeting was a bewildering reality. The selective summary of long hours of interrogation so written in a mail to Manoj was intended to enlist the support of UNDP, which had been actively assisting the caretaker government. In fact, all kinds of intelligence techniques were employed to what is known to be intelligence parlance, break me. For example, humiliate me by keeping me waiting at a clerk's desk, deal with me in a dismissive way, not listening to my answer, disorient me by skipping from one set of questions to another, all dating back a decade, intimidate me with many more false allegations, in summary, trying to box me into a corner. To all their manipulations, I had one clear answer. I am not going to be intimidated into a falsehood. Give false testimony against Sheikh Hasina, who was was then in custody. I had lived many glorious moments, narrated a few, and did not live to account for my decade-old actions here and now. When the major threatened me with the cases pending to be filed against me, I politely said, Amin. At the end, the major was in two minds. At first, he wanted to hold me up with stacks of old files till I saw eye to eye with him. But later, he changed his mind to let me go and mull over the choices he had offered. Either agree to their proposal and remain free or face the consequences. I made it clear as I left his office that I had only one choice, truth on offer. 
but then I left with a heavy heart, having been dealt in a way that I could not find parallel for in my long three and a half decades of public service. I was stunned at the swift pace of events that seemed to undo the assured coordinates of my life and send them into a tailspin. I had told my wife about the call from the task force, which by then had acquired a notoriety that sent a chill, particularly to the those who had spent their lives trying to be on the right side of the law. She called me over my cell phone when I was being questioned. Of course, I could not answer her calls. My family, as much as I, wanted to believe that the visit would entail some kind of assistance to the investigations. Never did we apprehend that anything worse could happen. As I drove back home, I was not sure how to break the news to my family. The good days had come to an end that we needed to brace for an uncertain future fraught with dangers. A couple of days later, a phone call came from the same major age, on purpose at midnight to lend the call the urgency and a clear threat. I was to attend a meeting at DGFI office in the cantonment the next morning. Early in the morning, I contacted, through some of my sources, Brigadier A, supposedly the boss of Major H. I told him that I was now a UN employee and there were certain set of procedures for my conduct under such circumstances and advised him to contact the UNDP. The composed manner of the brigadier soon gave away to irritation and eventually to threat. In the long conversation with him, I remained firm in my stance. Later I got in touch with Lieutenant General M, Chief of Anti-Corruption Force, but to no avail. On my insistence on the UN route, Brigadier A lashed out, saying that he would get my contract cancelled by calling Renata Logdasalian, resident coordinator for the UNDP Dhaka, and proceed against me, which was going to be far worse. At one point, he said he might consider issuing a warrant of arrest against me. The case of Sigma Huda was cited to drive home to me the worth of a UNDP connection. Sigma Huda was a lawyer, wife of a former minister, and a human rights activist on a UN roster who had been taken into a custody on charges of corruption along with her husband. Sigma was seriously ill and not let out on bail, reportedly even after UN intervention. I didn't attend the meeting. My gut feeling said that the intelligence guys were trying to get a group of officials who might have worked with me in the past in a meeting with DGFI office and intimidate them into giving false testimony, which they might have already done so against me. In that case, I would be the only person differing with the group and would appear less credible and might even lose my confidence. The DGFI could also, with cooperation of amenable officials, orchestrate the more allegations against me. Thus, by refusing to walk into their scheme of things, I had infuriated the brigadier, whose facade of politeness soon gave away to rudeness and threats. I used the UN card to deflect their strategy and waited for their next move. At the back of my mind, I was not too sure that this would work, but then I could buy some time. In the meantime, I tried to connect people I knew abroad and keep them posted about what was happening to me. Typically in countries like Bangladesh, dramatic political changes are not random phenomena. Most likely, they are endorsed, if not orchestrated, by power outside. My first pick was Iqbal Qadir, who was teaching at Kennedy School of Harvard and with whom I had been working on Emergence, a pilot project in rural Bangladesh. It was a microelectric network based on biogas produced from cow dung. One such communication on Sunday, August 19, 2007 read, Dear Iqbal, thanks a lot for your mail. Inshallah, I shall get back to you about emergence once things settle down, hopefully in my favor. I feel hurt when somebody questions me about my integrity and enraged when one dares box me into giving false testimony. Best wishes to you all. Taufik Bhai. The same day, Iqbal sent me an email. Dear Taufik Bhai, Inshallah, indeed, I am sorry to hear about this hassle but I'm sure you will handle it appropriately. 
please do keep me posted if i can be of any use i recently met someone named mr mifta in boston area he remembers you very fondly with best wishes to you and your family iqbal A period of uneasy lull followed while I remained apprehensive of any sudden action against me, particularly a knock on the door in the middle of the night. Three weeks went by and I was lapsed into the impression that the initiative against me might have been ebbed. The shock came on 3rd September. A call came from a friend, Imtiaz, on 3rd September evening. His wife had just heard my name being mentioned in a local TV. I called my wife. from the bedroom and switched on the tv my spine straightened the new scroll at the bottom of the tv screen showed up i had been named as an accused along with others in graft case against former prime minister sheikh hasina my worst fears had come true the world around me spun in one swift move transforming all its meaning i became an onlooker rather than a participant The fact that I might soon be incarcerated started taking the known familiar world away from me. It was receding into the forbidden territory. I started viewing everything with a strange new never experienced motion. The canopy of rain trees across our TV room and the balcony watching us rain or shine looked obscure and the frozen in the evening darkness. My surroundings, chairs, tables, the few paintings on the walls the light bathing us from the wall the roof all stood in mute silence of a broken relationship i could not quite feel what was in my wife's mind i called my daughters and asked them to come home a new day of reckoning had started around events a decade old long forgotten we all huddled together my wife two daughters and son-in-law trying to make sense of it all questions apprehensions impending loss sadness all bundled in incomprehensible kaleidoscopic motifs drifted in my mind and i guess in others too having lived a life of honesty integrity and professionalism without fear or favor for which i had paid occasional prices too i now stood accused in the lingering afternoon of my life of being an accomplice to a graft I could sense in my inner core that it meant to be a part of a tragedy, a writhing anguish of being let down by life, being cheated when I was weak to stand up, mocking at my long-held pride, trying to destroy the edifice of my existence. Slowly but surely I stood up to reclaim my ground. My anchor, as always, has been in my trying times, my faith in God. It was faith that came to my rescue. I recalled the verse from Quran verily i shall put you on test with fear hunger loss of wealth and life and blessed are those who are patient a sense of peace began dawning on me i count each day as the morning breaks happy to be born with my network of existence still intact my small family and extended family of relatives friends well-wishers spanning my neighborhood the city and beyond to three continents each day is thus a gift of god a day of freedom to be reckoned lived enjoyed and remembered and then tucked away in the treasure chest threatened though as the night gathers its hours when a knock at the front door can terminate it all this life on edge gives a temporal spin to all long held relations taken for granted i am conscious of all these so intently that i eagerly count each hour of day the morning breaks the day's work begins with the biding to my family the ride to the office as i pass by countless strangers who seem to be tied with a bondage gone unperceived for all these years the sunshine that bathes unremittingly the tender wind caressing the soft touch of love savoring the joy of living i let go all my senses as if i am on a last mission not to lose out on any of the bounties of today and now to capture all the richness of sight sound smell and touch the wholesomeness that occasionally at best i casually aware of i'm in a hurry The intense living has its downside also. I feel the pleasures of now, while an aching pain of impending loss wells up every now and then. 
As the continuity of days is cast in doubt, so are my relations to the world around, fractured. I start visualizing the time in prison, organizing life in the absence of endearing things that nourished my existence, a kind of preview of life after death, from the world of the dead. In a strange way, I find this an interesting and unique opportunity to be able to watch the world in my absence and what would come about to fill in. Now, here is how I counted the balance sheet of my life. Losses A vagueness of existence, not as engaged as it used to be, withdrawn, a sense of remorse, confusion about how life treats you, a loss of faith in the working of the world, a sadness at the end of your life's turn. You can't laugh at life with the zest and fondness with which you had got used to it. A detached grievance of being unfairly singled out and a more distant relationship with the surroundings as if the old relations do not hold valid anymore the lurking knock at the door in the middle of the night a reminder of the dark days of pakistani regime having fought for liberation decorated for gallantry a gestapo gesture from those we fought to liberate the angst anguish of shattered dreams honor and dignity denied, so fondly thought of as unsaliable rights over three decades earlier in 1971. Gains Outpouring of love, affection and support, a unique opportunity of viewing the world in a new perspective, preparing for and being, hopefully not, incarcerated. Taking stock of life, when the going is good, even when you are old, you tend not to look at the horizon. Each day is noticed, received, lived in freedom, the freedom of life. A sort of preview of death and the world after you, reclaiming faith in God. I was hoping against hope that my contacts with UNDP would turn out as a savior. I had kept Renata Desalian, boss of Manoj, also informed. One of the last emails sent on Saturday, 22nd September 2007, although of no avail, read, Dear Renata and Manoj, you both have been very supportive in my trying times, unjust as they are. There have been some developments since I wrote to you. On 20th September, Anti-Corruption Commission went ahead to proceed against the former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. My name is included in the case, under the emergency provisions, which means the government intends to move fast. The law provides 140 days for trial. The Chairman, Anti-Corruption Commission, in the meantime, has indicated that he would take a fresh look at the merits of the case before Anti-Corruption Commission moves effectively with the trial. It has not submitted charge sheet as yet which is required to set the trial in motion. I see a window of opportunity for my name to be dropped from the case. The argument is simple. No proposals move to the higher authority from the secretary without the approval of the minister in charge. In this case, the minister was Lieutenant General Nuruddin, retired. Since Anti-Corruption Commission has not included his name, by the same token, my name cannot justly be there. I still have a lingering hope that the argument may click with the chairman of Anti-Corruption Commission. If at all, it has to happen in the next couple of days. I look forward to your support at this critical juncture. Believe me, had there been a guarantee of fair trial, I would have thrown the gauntlet and seen to the end, hoping to file a libel at the end. But then we all know the state of affairs in the court. Best wishes, Taufik. Although Renata and Manoj knew me professionally, there was never an occasion from them to know our past not to speak of the modest role I had in the Liberation War. I could not resist sharing one such event which I believed would help them understand me better. With that hope, I sent this email on Tuesday, October 9th, 2007. Dear Renata and Manoj, Attached is the copy of the document pertaining to the money and gold that was deposited to the government of Bangladesh in 1971. The original is with the Liberation War Museum located just across the Secretariat. 
if you have not visited the museum i recommend that you do i hope one day to write before it's too late about the high drama of getting the money together from banks and treasuries transporting them in three rickety trucks first through strafing and bombings of pakistani air force and then through the terrorist domain of naxalites in india for over a month before they were deposited to our government in calcutta this was a financial lifeline of our war for quite some time Incidentally, US dollar was then selling for rupee 4.5. The cash thus worked out equivalent to US dollar 10 million in 1971. I thought you may enjoy a glimpse of our past. Taufik. Here there is a letter. The letter written on official letterhead with emblem of Bangladesh government. Ganoprajatantri Bangladesh Sarkar. Joy Bangla Office of the Finance Department Government of Bangladesh delivered and received 76 sealed boxes said to contain 1 rupee 4 crore 40 lakh 89678 only 2 prize bonds worth Rupee two hundred and fifty only. Three NDSCs worth rupee one thousand only. Four gold ornaments weighing twenty kgs, four hundred and ten grams. Five steel trunks, seventy six pieces. Six locks. 76 pieces and 7 coins of unknown quantities from captain mahabubuddin ahmed sdpo jinaidaho and captain taufik e elahi choudhury sdo meherpur at the bangladesh mission calcutta at 0030 hours on 26th may 1971 the said boxes shall be opened for the counting in front of either of the above mentioned persons or both or any representative from sector hq jashore sector signed by captain taufik elahi choudhury sdo meherpur and captain Mahbubuddin Ahmed SDPO Jinaidaho as deliverers received by K A Zaman In the meantime as I was coming to terms with the unfolding of the malicious game plan of the caretaker government with the shadowy army behind another person a dear friend looked like being drawn into a dragnet Dr S A Samad also a retired civil servant like me had taken up a job as a professor of economics in Solomon Island in the South Pacific his name too appeared in one of the cases along with mine i guess a design to make the case against Sheikh Hasina look credible on Wednesday October 3rd 2007 he sent this email my dear tofik it was great to talk to you After all this gap I admire your spirits the last few years have had mixed impact on all of us I for one lost my usual courage for which I was known amongst my friends life's adverse twists and turns makes you lose your character thanks for the encouraging notes what should my servants tell people if they visit again they do not know where I am others advise that they should tell the name of the place but those who are in my patrons here advise against that my bidesh can be a good substitute please advise me on this when your mind is not free you do not enjoy life as much i am in such a scenic place and yet i tend to overlook the surroundings and all it can offer my best wishes for all samad we exchanged a series of emails a few quoted below dear samad bhai your surprise call and that too from a far off pacific island was an instant joy for me i could feel the touch of silky breeze 
the rustling of the palm trees and the sound of the unending waves those that never stopped with the ups and downs of our lives and for that matter of civilization i have found refuge and courage in the unending friendliness of nature and through it to allah it's been and still is a tough time for me on the face of it life has been unkind digging deep into the past and cooking up stories as if to humiliate me and strip me of my pride and dignity when i have the least opportunity to reclaim them but then i found that allah has announced his choice of putting us to test in so many ways with the promise that glad tidings await those who are patient i pray that i have been through the tests and awaiting his blessings as for you enjoy the time that fate has given you make the most of it yes say that you are in bidesh which is true when destiny turns a new page we shall all be together to celebrate till then best wishes and keep well tawfik my dear tawfik i was delighted to go through your email i admire your courage and determination yes life has not been very kind to us since 2001 we do not know whether it is someone else's doing or our own i believe in god and his mercy but minor irritants always make me sad and i have difficulty in coping with them at this age in retirement people live in peace look at us i had no intention of taking up another job in my life but i was almost forced into it if i ever have a chance to meet you i will tell you in details some morons become the conscious keeper of the land and get selected for all the jobs around without ever doing anything and the best ones languish on the wings this is the perverse selection for sure i'm sure you will be vindicated those who know you will never for a minute believe that you can do anything remotely improper take care i will be in touch best wishes for asma duli and ridula i hope they are well samad my dear sadi my nickname i hope you are doing fine i was terribly upset sick and depressed for the last one month i'm beginning to recover mentally but i am very sick with high blood pressures urinary tract problems multiple cirrhosis for whatever that may mean and other ailments things will heat up for sure in the weeks to come please remember that there is another person in whatever you do and i am sure that you will i remember dear kuzrut bhai and his fine sense of humor kuzrut bhai was my elder brother a member of the then civil service of pakistan who was killed in 1971 during our liberation war his end was so sad and so brutal when i come to think of that i lose some faith in humanity itself and then what you and i are going through my prayers are with you i'm forlorn and shipwrecked i will not be able to travel at all for all that would be the end of me in this world happy new year to all of you asma amridula and duli may god preserve us all in the land of milk and honey the vultures are having a field day the antithesis has come around full circle so be it and the rest will be silence it will all end with a whimper and not a bang i'm sure of that only our sufferings will remain as a testimony to a very unfair system where the victims has no right not the minimum of self defense and there is the presumption of guilt in everything you do happy new year sam dear samad bhai sorry i had not written back to you sooner i'm concerned about your health nothing is more valuable than that rest will come to pass i know it's not easy to say but i guess i'm developing some kind of immunity from the stresses take it easy for destiny is not for us to design and be it i have not nor do i want to lose faith in the triumph of truth against the emaciation of men in the afternoon i hate to call it as dusk of our lives we have not much to lose except in the eyes of some but for some people like you and me our conscious comes first and we can part our ways in the world smilingly with our heads high yes all these years i have silently carried every day the crushing memory of kudrut bhai and i have not got many answers but such are the designs of the almighty take good care of your health and let's pray tofik